What is a cipher? So a cipher is a, um, a male over the age of 13 who has trained and studied all the laws of the um, scribal arts, which is the halachic way of writing the Torah, Tefillin, and Mezuzah. Um, he's trained and he knows all the laws. There's many, many, many laws. There's probably more laws in this field than any other Jewish field. As far as I know, there's over 5,000 intricate laws. A lot of laws pertain to knowing when you're allowed to correct something, when you're not allowed to correct something. Um, so the law is that he has to be a Jewish male over the age of 13, and he has to obviously be religious, and he has, to, he, has to, he has to be trained and know the laws. He has to be tested to make sure he knows all the laws. So there's, there's two parts of a sofa. There's the knowledge, and then there's the practical implementation. A lot of, of sofa know a lot. Um, but they're not, it's like a surgeon. You can have a surgeon who knows all the books, but he doesn't have a steady hand. And you can have a surgeon who's very, you know, he's good, he got a very good hand, but he doesn't, he's not so familiar, he doesn't have an experience. So you need to have a safer is someone who really, he's God-fearing, um, he knows the law, and, he's, and he knows how to implement it well. So, the, so that was really what a safer is. The question is, what is he writing, right? What is the law? So a safer is the one that writes the mezuzahs, the mezuzahs, the tefillin and, uh, and sifiteira. Um, we all know that there's a, there's a mitzvah in the terror that every single home needs to have a mezuzah on the door. Um, and there's many laws in a, which goes into how to write a mezuzah. There's a lot of laws in how to make the parchment. But a scribe, really, a cipher really needs to know the, just the, the writing. Today, it used to be that a cipher used to make everything, used to make the parchment, um, you know, and uh, used, used to be a lot more broad. It would make the parchment and uh, it would make his ink. Today, the cipher would buy parchment. There's a lot of companies that make good kosher parchment. Um, and he would know he has to learn how to actually write. Every day, before, like you started off your session with putting stuff into the tzaka pushka, my magiyim put a tzaka, a tzaka into the tzaka pushka and ask Hashem to help that they shouldn't make mistakes because it's not, not that difficult. You know, you can miss something. So you have to really be very careful. Try your best. But at the end of the day, with all the precautions that you put and with all get the best game in the world, you get the best sight from him, the best whatever it is, you need to have siyat adishma, you need to have Hashem to give you a blessing that you shouldn't make a mistake. We always ask Hashem that we should, you know, nothing should come out of our hands which wasn't done right. Because at the end of the day, we're human, so a human can be human error. But uh, you have to set your standards right. If you have very lousy standards and then you say human error, that's called being reckless. If you have good standards and you try your best, you have to still dive into Hashem, but then you got to do it right. The uh, Prima Godin brings, in the beginning of... Um, Primigodim is one of the great halachic uh, authorities. Go ahead. So he writes that the Yerushalayim of a Seifer uh, surpasses the Yerushalayim of a Sheikhet. The God-fearing, the, the integrity, let's say, of, the, of, the, uh, of a Seifer is, is even more than of the, that of the Sheikhet. The Sheikhet is, is the ritual slaughterer for kosher, for kosher meat. And he explains why. He says that when somebody is shechting an animal and he messes up and he does, you know, he used to be back in the day, he used to buy a cow the shaykhit, and he would shaykh it. And if he messed up, and now it's not kosher, it would be a very big challenge for him to uh, own up and say, you know, uh, this stuff wasn't done right now. I'm gonna, he's going to sell it to a non-Jew. It's going to be, they're going to lose its value. Selling it to a Jew, the kosher meat is going to be, you know, a lot more valuable. So it was a very big challenge, to, to, to be honest. Uh, but if this shaykh wasn't honest, let's say, and he uh, couldn't control himself, and he said, yeah, yeah, it's okay, and he sold it to the Jew, and the Jew now is going to be eating something which is non-kosher, but tomorrow, he'll buy a kosher piece of meat. So, you know, for he, we, he did a sin. And uh, I mean, it's, not, it's not a small sin because really, when you eat meat, it actually stays in your blood forever. But, you know, for practical purposes, you, you, you eat it, and then the, the, for the rest of your life, you're going to buy kosher meat. However, in contrast to a mezuzah and tefillin, when a scribe, if he's not honest, and he covers up his tracks, and he made a mistake which is not fixable, that Jew who buys that tefillin mezuzah, God forbid, he may never know. And he could be making a blessing in vain every day on that tefillin. And he could be not protected with that mezuzah tefillin. And he'll never know. So this is something which is a lot more serious because this is a lifetime. Stam is actually an abbreviation for Sefer Torah, the Samach Sefer Torah, Toughest Tefillin, and Mem, 
of the Stam is from a Zuzah. It's an abbreviation. So Sefer Torah means the Torah scroll. Torah scroll. So Stam means... So you stam sell... Stam. You sell Sefer Torahs, Mezuzahs, and Tefillin, right? Correct. Exactly. Obviously, okay. Megillahs and other things, but mainly that's the, yeah, the Torah, Tefillin, and Mezuzahs, exactly. And Megillahs too, okay. Every single letter has to be written according to the law. Every letter has certain specific instructions how to write it. There's the core um, form of every single letter. If that core form is misshaped, misshapen, the letter could be non-kosher and it cannot even be corrected later because if the, because the mezuzah and tefillin has to be written in order. So what we do is we use a, we use a feather which comes from a, a, a goose or a turkey um, Really, it's permissible to use anything, even metal, which some opinions say metal shouldn't be used, but you could technically, according to the, strictly according to the law, you could use anything. You could, you could use a calligraphy pen. Um, but the traditional way, you do, this is what they've been doing for thousands of years, and it's actually, you know, many Chabad to specifically use a feather, and even particularly from a goose. Um, um, that's, the, that's what we use to write the mezuzah and tefillin. We basically, if you look close here, we, it pretty much looks like a calligraphy pen. I mean, can you see it? You basically have... Mm -hmm. You know, the tip has to be cut, and then there's like a split at the end, and obviously every scribe will cut it at the angle that it's comfortable for him. Some like a more of an angle, some like a less of an angle. Um, it's actually interesting to note that Rabbi Zirk and Oliver Shon, um, he told me the story himself, that he used to be writing with a, a pen of metal. And he was sitting in Yechidz with the Rebbe, and he told the Rebbe that he was doing so. And the Rebbe said, why are you doing that? You shouldn't be using metal, you should be using a, a feather. And Rabbi Zirkin told him, that why not? It's a quant halach, a quant to the law. It's not a problem to use with metal. I think the Bnei Yehuda, those Rishayim, they, they wrote tears with metal, and the, the, the Rebbe told him that true quant halach you can. However, it's a mini chabad that in Lubavitch, that he said that in Lubavitch we always use a, uh, a gans and a feather, a, a, you know, a feather from a goose. And so he mm -hmm. said, why? He had the guts to ask the Rebbe like why, and the Rebbe answered him that it's like a siyog, it's a fence around a siyog. So basically make it a little bit more challenging for a cipher to become a cipher. It shouldn't be so easy that anyone that wants to pick up a pen and can start producing tefillin and mezuzahs when it needs to be. It's a, it's a job which needs to be done with so much integrity and you're a shemayim. Someone needs to be someone who's God-fearing and knows all the laws. And we want to make it a little bit more difficult. It shouldn't be so easy for anybody just to pick up a, a, a pen and write. So that's the feather that's used. That's the, that's the, that's the tool that's used to write. Uh, ink, that's the next thing. Ink could be made from anything which is kosher, or which is not from something which is non-kosher. In other words, it cannot be made from pig. Um, I think that the ink is like the only thing that does not have to be made, the shame kedushas, mezuzah tefillin, or whatever it is, doesn't have to be with the kavana. As long as it's something which is kosher, technically speaking, you could take um, any, you know, black dye or anything, which is, I believe the same writes that ink is just two things. It has to be black, and it has to be a mamoshes, which sticks, obviously. It has to have a thickness to it. I think the same rice has to have a thickness. So if it has a dye, a black dye, that's not good enough. That's why sometimes these like these black pens that you buy, um, you know, even if it's kosher ingredients, technically, it doesn't have any pig, pig inside or anything. But if it's just like a dye, it doesn't have a mamash, it doesn't have a, a substance to it. It's not the ideal thing. It has to be a certain mama, a substance and it has to be black and has to stick. Is This is actually, after speaking to a scientist, there's a guy, his name is Tzvi Shkedi, he lives in Stranton. Uh, he was actually a scientist who used to create um, for, the, for, for, the, for the aircrafts, different things. Uh, Chabad guy, and the, he told me, that the Rebbe told him he should use his talent to, uh, for, for holiness. And for, for years already, he's been creating an ink, which is a waterproof ink. It almost is like a plastic, and it doesn't actually ever erase uh, with mm. water, with time. And he said he did speed testing and all kinds of testing, you know, like under a lot of pressure and with a lot of heat. You put it into water, nothing happens. You bend it back and forth a million times, nothing happens. It's a very interesting bit. The product which actually I've been using when I write um, a lot of very uh, good stuff from using it. It's like a synthetic ink. It's, it's chemicals. It's synthetic, which according to Allah is not a problem. Rabbi Zirkin actually was one of the first or, or the first to create such a, such a product. So you're going to write a mezuzah. The first thing you do when you write the mezuzah is you make lines on the, parch on the parchment, right? Can you talk about those lines? So a mezuzah or tefillin or Torah has to have sirtut, has to have engraved lines. And the reason is because you want to write straight. But really more than that, it's actually a lachal Messinai, 
that the mezuzah has to have sirtut. That means that, that means that Moses received in uh, at Sinai that it has to be done that way. Can you show yeah. us that again? See if we can see it on the camera. I'm not sure. So if you look very close, you see over here there's lines over here. Yes. Even on the sides, on the margin of the of the writing, you can see there's lines. So those lines run all the way through and through, all the way across. Obviously, there's not allowed to be a hole. It has to be done very gently. There should not be a hole going all the way in because if there's a hole, so then the, the, the mezuzahs could be non-kosher if you write over a hole. Because again, there's another law that all the letters have to be, mukha kvil has to be surrounded by parchment. So every single letter has to be black, has to be fully intact with the exact form like we said before, with all the crowns, there's a lot of different details. And it has to be that, not, that nothing is, um, there's not, nothing, not, no cuts, no connection, no connect, you know, one letter shouldn't be connected with the other letter, that can make it invalid. So we have that we start off by lining the, the mezuzah and tefillin. Tefillin, it should be like that as well, so the writing should be straight. Um, but even if it doesn't have it, it's still kosher, but the other mezuzah, if it doesn't have those lines, actually it's non-kosher. There's a question, what happens if the lines get faded out later? That's already a discussion. But it definitely has to, it definitely has to be there from the outset when the mezuzah is being written. You have to write on those lines. It has to be perfectly straight. The top of the letter is on the line. So the mezuzah has two chapters. Why were those two chapters picked? Why, why those two paragraphs of the Torah on the mezuzah? Why those two chapters were picked? That's what Hashem decided. It happens to be that, it, that the mezuzah does discuss the unity of God, and um, it discusses the idea that Hashem is commanding us to write the mezuzah on the door. So I'm right. assuming that's why Hashem chose those uh, chapters. But why those two chapters? That's what, the, that's what Hashem tells us. How long does it take to write a mezuzah, approximately? So that's a good question. It really, it really depends on the quality and the talent of the cipher. A mezuzah that's written very carefully, nicely, could take three hours, four hours. But uh, there are scribes that can write them quicker in two hours, and some could even write them in an hour. That's when pe people ask, you know, they, you know, there's a concept of like a meftzai mezuzah or like an inexpensive, you know, the cheaper mezuzahs. People say, you know, what's the difference? There's a cheaper one and more expensive one. If it's kosher, it's kosher, right? What's the difference? So, of course, at whatever you're going to be buying, you want it to be hundreds in kosher. It shouldn't be compromised. Um, and unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, Judaica shops that are not aware of what they're doing. They're not scribes themselves, and they're just buying from Israel. We could discuss this also. What makes it compromised? What makes it mezuzah? Non like, what details could be that it's not kosher or that it's but you have a kosher? So let's say, for example, let's get a pen and show you. Um, let's draw it for you, right? Where's my pen? Let's say, okay, what letter is that? That's a vav. Okay, well, that letter could be a vav, but let's say if I put it next to something else, let's say, okay, you know, let's say, let's say, what letter is that? Okay, that could be a yud because it's much right. smaller. It could, be, it could be a yud. It could be a vav or it could be a yud. So now, when you have a letter which is not written correctly, the cipher is writing so quickly, we have this a lot. You can have a vav, which is a bit too short. And sometimes it could be clearly a yud. Very often you have a yud, which is too long, it could look like a vav. Um, a lot of times you have, there's, there's countless things which could go wrong when a scribe is writing very quickly or when he's not scrupulous, he's not careful. Very often there could be letters which are too close to each other. Letters could be touching one another. The spacing of the words, if the spacing is not correct, it can make it non-kosher. If you have two words looking like one word, um, and then every letter has to be the, 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 correct, uh, the correct shape. Um, for example, the crown's missing, so that doesn't make it non-kosher, but it could be but the kosher. For example... Can you show the us the crowns, please? Show us the crowns of them. So you see over here, that on the letter Shin and on the Ayin, there are three crowns. Yeah. If you look at the letter, if you look at the letter Yud, or the letter Hey or Dalit, I'm not sure, is it clear in the picture? Bedek Chayo, Bedek Chayo, Beis, Dalit, Kof, Ches, Yud, Hey, those letters have to have one crown. The Shatnes Getz letters, Shin, Ein, Tesh, Nun, Zayin, Gimel, Tzadik, including the final letters, have to have three. So the Shatnes Getz, the three crowns of those letters, if it's missing, a contra bin Otam, it's non-kosher. La Halacha, it is bidi Yavik, kosher. Now, the Rebbe says, Safi, Bishal, Teri, Yash, It's a very serious thing, and it has to be there. We don't sell things without that. Um, so a lot of times you find missing Shana's guts. Um, my phone is on 20%. Okay. Um, if it's missing, so that 
according to most opinions, it's still a chatzilah kosher. But uh, it's not mahudr. And you're not supposed to sell So what you're saying, so, so let me understand. So what you're saying is that some unscrupulous uh, sofrim, or those who just don't know, they're ignorant, and they're writing very, they're not writing them properly. So in the first place, the mezuzah is not kosher in the first place, or just barely, barely kosher. Is a continuation to what you said before, um, how long it takes to write. So if, it, if, this, if the scribe was God-fearing and he was doing his best, so, you know, it could be his best is to write a mezuzah in, in an hour. And it has the details in there which make it kosher. But it's not so pretty, it's not so beautiful, it has certain details missing, but it has the details in there which make it kosher. But then there's a cipher who just doesn't know properly the laws or he just doesn't have the talent to be able to produce a kosher mezuzah. And there are certain details in there which is missing which will compromise the kosher status. It'll, be either, it'll either be bidiyev, it'll be outright non-kosher. Are those the, like the cheap mezuzahs that you buy that are really cheap because they're just writing them without being, uh, knowing what they're doing? So if you pick up a cheap mezuzah, chances are it may not be kosher. Correct. The chances are if you buy a mezuzah, which is like a $40 mezuzah, $30 mezuzah, the chances are that it's going to be missing certain details and very often it's going to be bidiyev or even worse than that. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, whole, the way the wholesale market works is that basically there's a lot of scribes writing in Israel and they're basically, they could be technically God-fearing, but they're under tremendous pressure financially and tremendous pressure just to produce because they have to sell their stuff to the, to the wholesaler. And the wholesaler basically, the relationship is between the scribe and the wholesaler. He's not dealing with the end customer. So it's not like you're selling, it's not like I'm putting up a mezuzah in my house and I'm going to the scribe and saying, could you please buy me a mezuzah? Right, like in back in the day, it was it was more like a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So today, it's like it's, it's it's a very big business, and that unfortunately that gives room for a lot of a lot of um, errors. Often, overlook you know things to be overlooked by mistake. Sometimes it can be just like you know not being careful enough. But there, let's say there's a cipher writing you know 500 mezuzahs a month, and a crazy amount of mezuzahs. He's doing a few a day, and understandably he's writing so quick that there could be many mistakes in the mezuzah. And he doesn't even mind that there's mistakes. And it could, be it could be not necessarily a problem that there's mistakes, uh, a few of them, as long as somebody later will check the mezuzah over and proofread it to make sure everything's correct. Now, that problem amplifies itself because what happens is the scribe doesn't put the crowns on, on the cheap mezuzahs. All those crowns that, crowns that we discussed, there's someone called him a tayeg, crown guy. He comes later, and often he's not even certified. Firstly, the scribes themselves, a lot of them are not certified, which that's a problem. That's a problem. The scribe has to be certified. A lot of scribes are not. They just never would push to get tested or they don't, they don't know enough halacha to get tested or it's too difficult or it takes too much time or they need the money or there's no demand from the market and they're not tested so they don't know certain things that could be important. Could be, they're not doing it on purpose. They just, you know, they, they didn't take it so seriously and then the crown guy who could be even less certified than the uncertified scribe, he's slapping on crowns very quick. It could be that he's a young guy that doesn't know what he's doing and very often he can mess up the mezuzah too and also. And very often, even more often, there are many crowns missing understandably, right? The crown guy is getting paid minimally. He's gone quick and he sneezed. He spoke to his wife, answered the phone. He had to go somewhere in the middle. Very often we find, this is normal. And the cheaper mezuzahs, they, 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 there's someone called him Tayeg and there could be crowns missing. So this, the guy who's checking over the mezuzah proofreading, it's critical for him to be really, really, really meticulous. Very, very detail oriented, very God fearing. He should be getting paid for his hour, not for the mezuzah, which is a very big problem. That's that the magi and the checkers are not getting paid Usually, for their time, they're getting paid per, per piece. It's, I give this example very often. A human being that does not have a leg is still a functioning, could still be, a, a, you know, still a, a, you know, a working human being. If he's missing, but, it, but it's very critical. It's very, it's very important for him to have his leg. Um, if he's missing his spleen or his heart, it doesn't work. Okay, so there's certain details in the mezuzah and the tefillin which, compare, which are compared to like the spleen or the heart. If there's a letter missing or exchanged or totally compromised, it's non-kosher, it just doesn't work. There are certain things, if it's missing, it's like missing a leg, totally be the evid, totally not ideal. Still kosher, still works. Then you have less, less critical things, like you have eyebrows or teeth or, you know, you name it, things which are not so critical and you could get away pretty well if you don't have those things. So in the mezuzah, there are certain details in there. If you go more carefully and slower, yeah, you need to be the chatzul kosher. It shouldn't be the evid. It cannot be missing limbs, limbs even if it's kosher. It has to have the, the real important things got to be there. But if it's missing, Little details, which are still make it, which, which, you know, the back of the base has to have a little, like it's, certain letters have to have little, cra little details, little proportions, measurements, you know, like a design that comes out and it goes like a diamond shape. Why would the design leg is like a stick figure? Let's say the legs of the doubt is stick, is like a stick. 
it's still kosher. It has still the proportion that makes it look like a kosher letter. But it's not muhudr. It doesn't have those details in there, like the eyebrows and those things, you know, if you can compare it to that. So that's really what the difference is. A scribe that's writing very carefully, very slowly, with all the details, he's gonna, it's going to take him longer. He's going to charge more for his time. It's going to be more muhudr, high quality. The more pretty, the more detailed, the more halakhically detailed, the more... Then you can have a mezuzah, which is just like, you know, according to the, according to the law, it doesn't have to be a uh, Royal's Royce. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, a piece of art. It has to have halakhically the details in there. You know, you pay a hundred bucks, you're going to get a nice, halakhically good quality mezuzah. The difference between a hundred dollars to two hundred dollars, that is more like the difference between like a Lexus or even a Highlander and a getting a Royal's Royce. You don't have to get a Royal's Royce. If you buy a Royal's Royce for your own car, get a Royal's Royce for your mezuzah. If you're buying a Lexus, you should be paying 150 bucks for a nice mezuzah. But if you're getting a regular car, you don't have to spend $150 or $200 on mezuzah, but you want to be spending at least $85, $100, get yourself a good quality mezuzah. The $50, $40, $30, you know, if you're lucky, it's like a chile kosher. My scribes, actually, I don't get from wholesalers. I try as much as possible to get from scribes personally. So uh, probably a big, overwhelming percentage of my things that I sell are from scribes that I deal with personally. But I definitely do still get, my, my goal is to not to have to deal with wholesalers. Why should I have to have a middleman? But there are still some times that I have a good item from somebody who I trust. I only get from very, very few wholesalers that I do know well and I trust them. And when we get anything, whether it's from a wholesaler, from, even from a scribe himself, we get everything proofread here and Machenstam by scribes and by my gim that I trust and that I know and I pay them for their hour, pay them per time. I don't, I don't pay people for, for their, um, for their, what's it called? I don't pay them for the per piece. Um, I have a very interesting way of, you know, as an incentive, they should be doing things right. On the back of the mezuzah, it says the letters Shin, Dalet, and Yud, which is Hashem's name. We don't say it in the, the Hashem's name, but this abbreviation stands for Shomer Dalsis Yisrael, which means that God is protecting the doorposts of the Jewish people. And we know for, we know for a fact that this is the, the case. This is what God tells us. Um, I mean, I myself can tell you stories of people who brought us Moses and Tefillin, and we, you know, we, they, they told us certain things, and we noticed that there was, you know, we, there was problems in Moses and Tefillin. I mean, I can tell you a story from today. Actually, I videoed a guy saying a story today, amazing story. Unbelievable. Guy lives very close to Kronites. And he had a son who had a serious, serious brain uh, tumor. And they did a surgery a year ago and he was suffering tremendously. They were worried that maybe he has other side uh, health issues. He was, they were very concerned that they found other, maybe other things, they're doing blood tests. Anyway, basically he came to us. He decided on his own to get a brand new pair of and a brand new mezuzah for his house. He got very nice mezuzahs and a beautiful pair of And then he said that the next day, his wife, his wife was in tears and said that, you know, he didn't, you know, the kid, he was swimming for three hours. He was in tremendous pain. He couldn't walk properly. He couldn't swim. He couldn't do things that he wanted to do. He was in tremendous emotional pain, tremendous physical pain. And he basically, uh, the next day, he was able to go walking and he was swimming for three hours without interruption. And, he, and, and the father told me today that he we went on a hike with him yesterday in the, on a steep hill. And the kid was fine for hours, hiking, and he had no pain. And he said that he's no question in his mind that the Tefillin and Mezuzahs did miracles for him. And when you have a Mezuzah on the door, of course, you're making a statement. Right? You're making a statement that God, you're inviting God into the house, so to speak. The mezuzah, the protection that, is, that comes along with the mezuzah is not just a side benefit. It's not just like a bonus. The protection that, that mezuzah brings is part and parcel, is embedded into the DNA of a mezuzah. So much so that the Rebbe told people to even carry mezuzah with them in certain instances. It's not something which it says in the Torah, but the Rebbe brought out the power. The Rebbe told in, in, his, in his talks, the Rebbe spoke about how a mezuzah just the mezuzah itself, not even doing a mitzvah. A mezuzah is protection. And therefore, the Rebbe told people to bring it, you see in the letters of the Rebbe, someone who wasn't well, put it under your pillow in the hospital, a pregnant, someone who's having a baby, um, you know, but leave it, have a mezuzah in your car. I don't know if these were official things, but the Rebbe spoke about the power of mezuzah, unbelievable. And there, anytime somebody had any issue in his life, the Rebbe would tell people, did you check your mezuzahs in the last 12 months? There was a point that a groaner even wouldn't even tell, wouldn't even let someone into the Rebbe before they checked the mezuzahs and fill in if they didn't do it within 12 months. Because that became like, an, like a typical, you know, like a generic response because it was such a, such a, it was, a it was an obvious thing that if you check your mezuzahs and fill in, almost always your thing would fall into place. And I can so, tell you myself, I, I've witnessed you know, hundreds of stories, hundreds of stories. We had a couple that came to our office 
uh, you know, several months ago, a South American couple and the wife, when they had two kids sitting on the chair, you know, in the chair sitting in my, in my uh, waiting room, she tells me, she's like, do you remember me? I said, no. She's like, well, we came five years ago. My husband, he started putting out filling for some time and, it, and we weren't able to have kids. I wasn't able to conceive. And you showed us that in the letter Shin, on the bottom, there's like a little disconnect. And um, she said that she was, you know, nothing was going. She said, you know, we got a new pair of film. Within 30 days, I conceived, she told me. And these are the two kids that we had since then. She said, now I came uh -huh. back. I'm going to buy my mezuzahs now, she told me. Anyway, we had a lot of stories. I mean, Phil and mezuzahs, just like the mezuzah has a shin dal and yod, Phil and also has the shin dal and yod. The Phil on the top on the shirash has the shin, has the dal by the knot, and the yod by the keshish or yod. So Phil and also protects. So we have to be very careful to make sure the mezuzahs are kosher, the tefillin are kosher, and not less important, that the placement of the mezuzahs are in the right place. Very, very, very often, even if you could have the best mezuzahs in the world, if you're missing a door, or if the mezuzah is not the right way, or it's upside down, or if it's you know, on the wrong side of the doorpost, it's a problem. And you're not, you're not getting the protection, you're not doing the mitzvah. And the Rebbe basically explained and said that the mezuzah, is the, or, a bad, or a mezuzah which is non-kosher, doesn't, God forbid, cause anything negative to happen. That doesn't make a bad thing happen. The Rebbe rather gave a comparison of a helmet. And the Rebbe said that a mezuzah is like a helmet of a soldier in battle. Then when you're fighting in battle, if you're not wearing a helmet and you get shot, it wasn't, that you, it wasn't that the helmet caused you to get killed. If you're wearing a faulty helmet, it wasn't the helmet caused you to get killed. Rather, if you're wearing a helmet, you're going to be much better protected and much better chance of getting protected. So we all, the Rebbe said how in today's day and age, or in always, a Jew needs godly protection. And there's nothing more, more powerful than having God protecting us at the entrance of our home, we have God on the, in the, in, on the mezuzah, which says that God is here and God is watching you and God is with you wherever you are. And that protection is the most great protection that a Jew could have. Rabbis in Israel that said that during Corona, one should not touch a, a public mezuzah, you shouldn't touch it. The touching of a mezuzah is a sign of respect. Um, it's actually, a, it's, it's, it's a custom, but I think it brings an halacha. Um, but uh, there were rabbis that said that during uh, Corona, you shouldn't do it because it's obviously, if it's a danger, then you shouldn't do anything. Uh, uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a conist of fascist, you shouldn't do it. It's a danger to life. It's a good thing to do. It's not a requirement. Not but a must, but it's a good thing. What's even more Actually, important is to keep, uh, put a stocker box in your car and put a chumish and a tehillim and a tanya. Which I just want to with. say, they sell, they sell these little car mezuzahs, which are pieces of paper and not worth anything. They right. look nice. If you're going to put a mezuzah in the That's car, it should be a kosher mezuzah. That's a very important point. A lot of Judaicists sort of sell uh, mezuzahs, but they're not really mezuzahs. They're selling the mezuzah cover. A mezuzah is not the cover. The, the deal, it's very complicated. Uh, I think the owner of the house, depends on who owns it, if, you're, if, you're, if the Jew owns the house, so then you need to put a mezuzah up. It's complicated if it's a partnership or the wife or the husband. I'm not sure, I'm not sure of all these laws. You well, definitely if, you have, definitely if you have your own room, if you're sharing a house and you have your own room, definitely your own room needs a mezuzah. The, 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 the general rule is that it's a chayv zadar. The one who rents, if you're a Jew that you pay the rent, uh, then it's your responsibility to have a mezuzah. Just because somebody else lives in the... If somebody else who just tagged along, the one who's renting and is paying for it, who owns it, so to say, that is, it's his responsibility. Not the landlord, it's the one who rents. So if you rent a room, that room is your responsibility. You rent an apartment, it's your responsibility to, to put mezuzahs up. If you're asking if there's a shared uh, rental with a Jew, with an non Jew, that gets a little bit more complicated, I, I, I'm not sure. The tefillin is, um, we put on, on our arm and on our head, and the tefillin has four parts of the Torah. So there's, in addition to the two that the mezuzah has, it has another two. What's unique about those four is that those four, having them, also the mitzvah, it talks about putting on, putting on the tefillin all, in all those four parts, right? Correct. And then the tefillin, every single, every single every Jewish male over the age of 13 is obligated to wear tefillin every single day of the week, besides the Shabbos and for Yantav. Um, tefillin, um, we have the sharash, we have the shayad, the, the head compartment, the, the head compartment. The head has, you know, there's four lines, four, there's four, cha there's four, uh, chap four parchments in the head. We have over here a sharash. This is like one of the bias, I'm sure you guys are familiar. The four, it's actually painted up and made black. In here goes four scrolls. So one second. So that, that is, so that is a form before it's been completed, before it's been painted. Okay. And 
This is before it gets painted up, right? This is, I'm just have a few different artifacts here. This is like the Shayan. Um, this is, you know, this is only one slot, right? See that? There's only one hole in here. The Torah says, Isa Yod Cha, singular. And the, the Shirash is four. We learn it out from the Pasuk. So the Shayad has really, all the, all the four parchments are all on one. one. Um, the Shayad has four chapters all on one. And the Shirash has the four parchments on four separate pieces of cloth. It's a little smaller and there was only four lines. So we roll it all up from the end to the beginning. And we put them into the, into the uh, four slots. There's a Kaddish, Reikiv Yachah, Shema, and Vahim Shemaya, four chapters from the Torah. The only difference is which hand you put it on. Um, the same exact filling. There's some, sometimes what we, what we do is we put it like the indent by the Yad, if we can show it here. So this is actually a Yad which has no indent. But I'm sure you guys are familiar that there's usually like a little indent on both sides. And if you're a righty, so the indent on this side because you're putting it on this hand, is going to be a little bit deeper in, so the Kesher could slip in a little deeper in. The knot is on the other side. The knot is always on the inside. Right, the knot is on this side by a righty. On a lefty, it's going to be on this side, because so you're putting it on this okay. side. But really, it's, it's, it's just a practical thing. Uh, logically, there's absolutely no difference. The, only the Kesher is going to be on the other side. Rashi Rinatam is basically... Uh, the the, the Rinatam basically disagrees with the order of the of the Shema and the Vayim Shemaya. According to Rashi, this first Kaddish Vayikav Yacha Shema Vayim Shemaya. According to Rinatam, you go Kaddish Vayikav Yacha Vayim Shemaya and then Shema. In so you're saying in which order, order the four portions are put into the into the tefillah? Put into the tefillah. Right. The writing is written in the same order. You, in other words, chronologically in time, you have to write Shema first, then you do the Vayim Shemaya. You don't write the Vayim Shemaya first. Just the question is what order in the tefillah itself. Uh, Shemush and Rabban Ravid, I would have to check up to remind myself exactly the differences because I don't re- wear them myself and I haven't. Um, I mean, recently, people sometimes come to us to check to Shemush and Rabban Ravid. I believe that it's just the rush. It's the same fill-in. You just change around the, 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 the rush with, of Rashi with the Yad of the Rabban Atam, something like that. There's like a different order of exactly. So Rashi and Rabban Atam were two, Rashi and Rabban Atam were two very great sages and they had a difference of opinion of how it should be put in. And our custom today is to put both pairs on, to put a pair on according to Rabbi Natam and a pair according to, um, to, to Rashi and a pair according to Rabbi Natam. Why do we not wear tefillin all day now? Um, I think the reason is because we are not on that level that we could be, when you're wearing tefillin, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to uh, you know, you have to be, uh, there's certain rules, like you're not allowed to have a bad smell, you have to be thinking about the tefillin, you're not supposed to be talking, I will talk, you have to be concentrating, thinking about God, when we put on tefillin, one of the things that you have to be, do when you put on the tefillin is thinking about, uh, you know, your heart should be subservient to God, your mind should be subservient to God. Um, that's what tefillin is all about. So it could be that back in the day, I believe that they were, you know, more spiritually inclined. They were able to, to keep focused. But today, because of the, the Eurydice Adairus, the descent of the generations, uh, you know, it's uh, not necessarily is it the most practical thing for everybody to be uh, able to do these things all the time while wearing tefillin. But essentially... If you're able to, then, you know, go for it. There were very uh, pious Jews not even too long ago, maybe even till today, that have that tefillah and pray to God for hours upon hours. They have that tefillah working on themselves to transform the negative traits and can bond with God, right? Davening, tefillah, connect to God. There are chassidim that even till recently, I think, they used to pray for hours and hours and hours. There was a chassid that used to daven from, you know, from the morning till four in the afternoon, and they, they would hit singing, hear him singing a song like, you know, his daven sich nicht. He's davening for eight hours and he still feels that he's not getting to where he wants to get, to get the connection to Hashem. So there were, there were even recently, even till today, there may be chassidim, you know, very, very special, unique individuals that daven for hours and hours. And that's fine. You're wearing a tefillin, you're davening. But to, 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 to do your business while you're da- putting it where you have your tefillin on, that's not appropriate. Well, you could ask the guy that came to my office today that told us the story with his son. He said he put on tefillin the first time that, I, that he got two couple days ago. And he said that he just feels so different. And he said his child. And he said he also does something in his business. He said his whole life twi- switched overnight. So uh, you get a good pair of tefillin. You'll see for yourself what it does. Um, but look, Hashem in the Torah tells us you put on tefillin, you put, you put up a mezuzah. And in the thing itself, it says, you're going to have long life. You're going to have a healthy, happy life. So it's a God, God's promise. It's not my promise. God promises that when you put on a kosher mezuzah in your door, and you wear tefillin, it will bring you blessings. So there's no question that God keeps his promise.
like I said, the, the, the protection and the blessings that are from the mezuzah is not something which is like a far-fetched thing, some spiritual thing. It's actually a very real protection. Like I said, the Rebbe used to always tell someone that had any physical challenge or anything going on, whether it was panasa or children or marriage or, you know, shalom, whatever it was, the Rebbe would say, check your mezuzahs. And uh, there was a direct impact. It wasn't something which was far It was a very direct impact that you, you, you have a good parrot feeling, you have a good mezuzah, and you will see results. It could be that with time, things could happen. Particularly outdoor mezuzahs, the weather has a very, very, plays a big role in the kosher status of a mezuzah. Um, weather is, is, mezuzahs and weather don't go together well. So heat, cold, humidity, rain. We see very often people check the mezuzahs, you know, Right before Rosh Hashanah, they check them as an L, and then three months later, you know, it gets very cold, and then letters can stop popping off. Things can happen with time, uh, the weather. Indoor mezuzahs also should be checked. Um, but I would say the, the main issue with the, the indoor mezuzahs is that originally was a problem. That's usually what happens. If things can happen with time. Things definitely could happen with time, but usually a mezuzah that if issue is found which is not weather-related, is because Lechatchila originally wasn't done right. Again, with time, things happen. A mezuzah after 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, you know, age can have an effect and things start popping off, start crumbling. Uh, you know, there could be cracks and different things just because of age. But like I said, the main, the, the mo most commonly is the weather. Um, and even indoors also, humidity can have an impact. So even indoors also, humidity can have a very big uh, role. And, and the, most, the most common thing is that just from the beginning, because it's a humanly, it's a, it's written by a human being, and human beings are not are only you know humans, and then we make mistakes. So even the best scribe can make a mistake, and therefore you check your mezuzah over and over and over again, because all you need is that one scribe who noted there was a crown missing, there was a little detail that could be corrected, there was something which could be made better, and we want it to be in the best way possible. Because what Jew knows is that what is it that what is the tuner, the channel, the, the the tube which brings down the the, the bl divine blessings into a Jew's life and protects him in his house and out of his house is his mezuzah and tefillin. What is it considered making? What is making? When you say making the, <clears throat> making the passion, what is the making? Is it the making when they actually tan the, the skin? Is the making, there's many different things you could think would be called making. So the, the, the answer to that is, according to the Alter Rebbe, um, the founder the of Chabad, Rebbe Zalman, yeah. Of the, Yandi, the first Chabad Rebbe, which he wrote, a Shulchan Aruch, um, the Shulchan Aruch Harav. So he says that the making of the tefillin, the making of the parchment or the, or the hide, whatever it is, when you put the, the raw hide into the lime and you leave it there to soak, that is considered the making. And therefore, as long as a Jew, he put the raw, smelly, disgustingly smelly hides into the lime, that already is considered making, and then the rest of the process of making the parchment or whatever you're making, it could be even made technically by a non-Jew, because the, the ibud, the main working, or the main, how do you say ibud in, in, in English, the, the main working on the processing. eyes, processing yeah. is, is, is done when you put it into the lime. When you put it, what, what are you doing when you put it into the lime? The, the hide is very, is very, very um, hairy, and very oily, and very disgustingly smelly, and very dirty. So you want to transform something which is raw and you want to make it into something which is, you know, workable and you can make it into a, into a piece of parchment. So they put it into this very, very strong chemical, which is called lime, and they soak it in there. And what that does is basically breaks up all the, all the, um, all the you know, all the bad stuff. And it basically makes it very easy when you come later and you, you know, you, you work the skin and everything just falls off very, very easily. All the hair and all the schmutz, and all the dirt. So that's really the main thing we have to have in mind. Obviously, there are many companies out there and, you know, they, they try to do all the steps of the process with a Jew and doing it lishma, so it should be more mohudir and more, you know, done in the best way. So the first thing is it has to come from a kosher animal. A mm -hmm. uh, common misconception that it has to come from a slaughtered kosher animal, that's not correct. There is a hider, it's like a nice, it's an extra thing, but it doesn't have to come from a slaughtered kosher animal. You could take a, a cow that was killed and which is going to be used for McDonald's and you could use that for your tefillin or for your Torah. It's not a problem at all. As long as it's a kosher kind of animal, it has to be coming from uh, a minamutra, but it has to be from a cow, an animal which could technically be used uh, and eaten. It doesn't have to be practically slaughtered in a kosher way, but it has to be a kosher kind. Um, it has to be 
uh, made every step of the way for the sake of the mitzvah. So it has to be a religious Jew that is uh, making it for the sake, it has to be the, the, for the kavanah, the shame mitzvah tefillin, and the shame mitzvah Torah. You have to have in mind when you're making it, um, that you're making it for a Torah, tefillin, and mezuzah. Really, the way we, what we do is we buy, when we buy parchment for tefillin or mezuzah, we buy the, um, there's different uh, customs. Some, some customs have a, um, the customs have a, make a condition when they, when they make the parchment. They make a condition that they're making it for, for, for a Torah, and they're making a condition that it can be used for something else. But our custom is that we have in mind just for a Torah, and being that a Torah is the highest level of holiness, higher than the Tefillin Amazuzah, automatically when you have in mind Torah, you're including the holiness of the Tefillin Amazuzah because they're a lower uh, stature. So as long as the cloth was made for the, the, the shame Sefer Torah, it's 100% fine, you could use it for a Tefillin or Amazuzah. So there are several kinds of writings. Um, again, the essential shape of the letter there's pretty much, um, there's less arguments about. It's like there's certain, the, the, an aleph has to have like that leg in the middle and has to have the head on top and head on the bottom. It has to have, you know, a rage. The, the, there are certain the essential part of the letter. But then there's, there's, there's details which, there's different opinions. Should it be a little more of a curve this way or more of a, de- uh, you know, a little thing coming out this way? Just more, you know, different, different, different details which there are different opinions about. Um, for example, there's like the Arizal and the, and the, and the Beis Yosef, um, Ksav. The, uh, if you look at this mezuzah, so over here, you look, if you look at the shin, you see the letter shin over there? Mm-hmm. Is it, you see it? Okay, so if you, yes. look at the le- if you look at the left head, the leg is coming out from the right side. And if you look at the ayin as well, the ayin of Shema, the, the leg is coming out from the left si- from the right side, correct? Right. So this is the Arizal Ksav. The Arizal said that the Hamshach of those, the Vav, it's, it's Hamshach of Vav. The Bish Yosef holds that it's supposed to be a Zion. So the, the, the left head of the shin and the iron, the leg comes out from the middle as opposed to coming from the right side. So there are certain fine nuances, there's differences, differences of opinion. There's a Sephardi Ksav, Beis Yosef, Arizal, and then there's the Altarebic Ksav. The Altarebic, you know, he was pretty revolutionary in many different areas of Yiddishkeit. He had his own Chalif, his own Mikveh, his own Siddur, his own Nusuch, many different things. And one of those things is the Ksav. So he trained his Sefer by the name of Reuven Miyanovich. And he taught him how to write a, 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 a ksab, which is compiled of many different opinions, Kabbalah and Nigla. And it was like a certain time in history. He told his Tom that a certain time of the month, now is the time right before Mashiach comes. At this time now, there's going to be a new light in the world and we're ready for this ksab. And he basically, there's many very interesting stories regarding this. But uh, the Al-Tarebbe ksab is a, is a ksab which is only, you know, since the Al-Tarebbe's times, a couple hundred years ago. Uh, it's a result-based ksab. It's more a result, that's not Beis Yosef, but it's really like a combination with many different other things. Um, but like I said, all the Ksavim have to have this. They're all the same, the same Nusuch, the same text, the same letters, the same Torah. They're just slight variations in the style of the writing. I got, I got certified by Mishmer Stam. Um, they are a very uh, famous uh, group of uh, you know, rabbis who are trying to, you know, keep, uh, keep the integrity of this field, which is very important. And they've been doing a good job for many, for 50 years already. The Rebbe gave them blessings and the Rebbe Vosner tests to me. Uh, but there are a number of those, the Badats in Israel, there are, you know, different, you know, the main thing is that it should be a respected Bezdin who, or a respected rabbi who knows the laws himself and who's giving a certification that the that describe his, his, uh, knows his stuff, just like a doctor, right? They say, why when, you, why, why when you go to a surgeon, you got to make sure that the surgeon has a, you know, certified, when you go into an airplane and your life's at stake, you don't check to see that the credentials of the, of the pilot is good. Uh, what's the reason? So it's very simple. The pilot's flying the plane, right? Exactly. You're going, you're going, you're going with you. But when you go into a surgery, or when you go into a spiritual surgery, so I, I, I look at it as the scribes check the mezuzah and tefillin as like a preventative surgery, preventative medicine. We're doing like a very, very, um, very deep, serious surgery, but it's not very invasive in the physical uh, sense. We're not touching the guy's, you know, skin, but it actually could do a lot more and it can prevent, you know, God forbid, surgeries and all these kinds of things. Yeah, we really, we got to make sure that, that it's kosher. And um, better to spend a couple dollars more and better to do a little more research and make sure that I guess you guys get from your rabbi and your rabbi knows where he's getting his things from and, um, and, and it's, everything's kosher and good. So it's just very important to make sure that these things, yeah. Cover. And mezuzah is not the cover. Mezuzah is the inside, it's the, the, the parts with the writing. The mezuzah cover could be uh, very expensive, but if it doesn't have a kosher writing, 
then it's pointless. The, the protection of the blood and the mitzvah is the mezuzah, not the cover. You can have a very simple cover. It could be 100% kosher. And you can have a very fancy case, but it has nothing in there, so it doesn't really do anything. Chabad people are known to put on tefillin on people. Always, always asking people, would you like to put on tefillin? Would you like to put on tefillin? What's this big deal about getting a Jew to put on tefillin? Tefillin takes a couple of minutes. Put on tefillin. Say, why, why are Chabadniks so out there trying to get people to put on tefillin? Very good question. Um, the Rebbe uh, introduced a number of different kinds of campaigns throughout his leadership. One of those campaigns was the Mifsa Tefillin. Why the Rebbe picked certain mitzvahs, we won't know, and we don't know. The Rebbe obviously saw the greatness of certain mitzvahs, which will not have an impact on the Jewish people and prepare the world for Mashiach. Um, but what's interesting is that the Rebbe did make, make a huge thing out of Tefillin, which uh, today already there are other, other communities, you know, even the literature communities are also going and doing Mitzvah Tefillin. You know, back in the day, they were saying, why are you, what are you doing? You're putting on Tefillin on someone who didn't watch Negevah series, impure, all these things. You know, the Rebbe addressed, and there's absolutely no problem with tefillin as a mitzvah from the Torah, which outweighs all these other things. And, and already today, the whole world is already doing mitzvah, mitzvah tefillin. And the whole world, Jewish world, understands the value and the importance of doing tefillin. It's a mitzvah from the Torah. There are many different things that, that, are, that the Rebbe discussed. Uh, one of them is that when you put tefillin on, it's like tying down the animal cell. You tie it down that negative inclination that you have. You're strapping down that dog that it shouldn't be able to make so much noise. It basically, it brings a person closer to Hashem. It, it, it connects his mind and his heart um, to God. Uh, that there are four things you have to have in mind when you put on tefillin, which that's the, the, the essence of tefillin, subservience of your heart. You know, the mind should be the thoughts to Hashem, the idea of unity of God, and the idea um, of the exodus of Egypt, which Chassidus explains that leaving Egypt is not something which happened thousands of years ago, it's something which we are doing every day, and that's the whole idea of tefillin. The idea of tefillin, which really runs across the, the, through, throughout Yiddishkeit, the idea of leaving Egypt, that a Jew, it's 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 something which a Jew has to constantly be leaving his boundaries. We all have a little box that we are comfortable with and we don't like to leave that little comfort zone. And the idea of tefillin is teaching us the idea that we are, we are going to be able, we are able to jump above and beyond. A Jew has a neshama which is infinite and the, the power of that infinite soul, which is one with God, gives us the power that we could go way above, we could rise above any challenge, any issue. Um, we are not limited to anything. So a person has to contemplate about that idea that when you're putting out tefillin, we are connected to Hashem, we have an Hashama, and doing a mitzvah tefillin is gonna, this gives us that power that we could rise above any challenge in the world. We have no, nothing stopping us from rising above any challenge, any difficulty, any challenge. That is the real, uh, deep, deeper, the pimeous, the, 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 the inner dimension of leaving Exodus, leaving our Mitzrayim, our Mitzrayim Vigvul, and our limitations and our boundaries. Um, and that is the, that, I mean, this is just why I suggest that maybe why the Rebbe, you know, the power of tefillin is, is, is unbelievable. Um, and the Rebbe, 51 years ago in 1967, by the Six Day War, I think, 67, right? Before my times, I think it was 51 yeah. years ago, when the Rebbe launched the, the Mitzvah Tefillin. And the Rebbe came out by Lag Boimer right before, you know, there was thousands of people in Crown Heights by the, on Eastern Park by the Lag Boimer Parade. And the Rebbe spoke right before the Rebbe, you know, there, it was a very scary time in Israel. And the, the president, he was, you know, they were already preparing mass graves. The, all the Arab countries were going to destroy Israel and going to wipe them off the map. And the Rebbe, you know, prophetically said, nothing to worry about. God is watching the Jewish people. And when the Jewish people will strengthen themselves in being mahadir and mitzvahs, and, you know, being more uh, meticulous in doing mitzvahs, particularly the mitzvah of tefillin. And the Rebbe quoted from the Pasuk, where it brings down that when a Jew puts on tefillin, it brings fear to the people of the world. It says, you're going to have fear. When you see the tefillin shabirash, you're going to have the, the nations of the world are going to be, be scared. And we saw in the newspapers that then, um, you know, pictures of the army dry, you know, driving their, their tanks down to the front lines. I mean, you saw the Chabad Mitzvah tanks with their uh, weapons of the tefillin. You see soldiers putting on tefillin. And uh, we know the amazing miracles that happened in the Six-Day War. You know, uh, there was like the newspapers recording the Rebbe's, the Rebbe's uh, you know, statement, put on tefillin and nothing's going to happen. The Rebbe said nothing's going to happen to the Jewish people. And we saw an unbelievable, you know, turning of events that within six days, not only did Israel then not get wiped off, but they conquered, you know, double and triple it was an amazing, amazing success. And thousands of Jewish people after the Six-Day War, they saw open miracles and they saw God, you know, openly. They saw open godliness, revelation of God. And thousands of Jews who were totally secular and totally, you know, they didn't keep a, 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 a Yiddishkeit. They, they, became, they became religious because they saw open miracles and they saw God's hand. 
Um, and this is always the mitzvah tefillin. So the Rebbe pushed it very strong. Why did the Rebbe choose it? Again, we can make up whatever reasons we like, but again, it's a mitzvah from the Torah, and uh, it bonds us with God. It's a daily thing that every single man does, and it brings protection to him and to his family. What could be a greater thing than that? Can I tell right, this is one of, the ten, one of the ten point mitzvah campaigns, the ten fundamental mitzvahs, like lighting Shabbos candles for women and uh, kosher mezuzahs, making sure you have a kosher mezuzah. Uh, these are all parts of the, of the campaign that the Rebbe pushed in order for us to introduce people to Judaism. And as we've seen, as you said, this has brought many people closer to Judaism. I, I would like to recommend one day when everyone travels again, anyone who's going to New York, to go visit Rabbi Raskin in his uh, Chon Stam. It's actually a fascinating place. I've been there a few times. You see the different types of mezuzahs and tefillin, and the, he can show you all kinds of problems that happen with the tefillin and mezuzahs, and, and the good ones and the nice ones. And um, uh, Rabbi, I want to thank you very much uh, for joining us. Would you like to add anything before we go? We should have Mashiach today ready. That's all I could add. Amen. That's what we're all waiting for, and that's what we need. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I want to encourage everybody to make sure you have kosher mezuzahs on your doors, on all the doors. We can help you with that. And thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us.
And a home, according to the Torah, is not just the front door, the front main entrance. A home is every single room. So this is like another entire field, but just on one leg. Any, any room which is used, you, you put things there, you eat there, um, even a storage room, every single room besides for a bathroom needs to have a mezuzah. 